नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एंड यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा China is preparing for war says who Beijing itself their president keeps telling his army to get ready and now their premier is talking about taking Taiwan by force that too in the country's parliament their economy is in bad shape entire industries need rescue packages but the only thing they're boosting is their defense spending what do we make of these moves and statements we'll discuss that tonight meanwhile the Maldives has signed a defense deal with China what does that mean for India and is it linked to India's new military base in Lakshadweep why does iran want a naval base in the sudan and why have they turned down that request why are indian app makers complaining to the government about google what's the human hair smuggling racket busted in india how is it linked to china france is the first country to make abortion a constitutional right what's the politics behind this move why is cuba the land of fidel castro and cigars making news for powdered milk Why is Zimbabwe selling the latest US sanctions as a foreign policy win? What's the 12 billion dollar scam that has taken Vietnam by storm and how fast fashion is getting faster and which governments are trying to apply brakes? All this and more coming up the headlines first. Hamas says Gaza ceasefire talks extended for another day. Israel has stayed away from the negotiations being held in Cairo, Egypt. There has been no breakthrough in the talks which began 2 days ago. Reports say mediators are now waiting for Israel's response to Hamas's proposal. The chief of the United Nations atomic watchdog to head to Russia, Rafael Grossi, will held will hold talks with President Putin about the Zaporizhia nuclear plant, the largest in Europe. In 2022 Russia captured it from Ukraine both Moscow and Kiev have accused each other of compromising the plant's safety In India the BJP launches a scathing attack on the DMK after its leader A Raja says India is not a country but a subcontinent also claims the people of Tamil Nadu won't accept slogans praising Lord Ram the DMK's India bloc allies including the Congress party distanced themselves from these controversial remarks Iran executed at least 834 people last year, the highest since 2015 compared to 2022. The number in 2023 was higher by 43%. It's only the second time in two decades that more than 800 executions took place in a year. Human rights groups have accused Iran of using the death penalty to spread fear. Two planes collided mid-air of the over the Nairobi National Park in Kenya. A student pilot and trainer have been killed after their aircraft crashed into a passenger plane but over 40 others managed to escape unhurt. The cause of the collision is not yet clear. And Montenegro holds the extradition of crypto fugitive Do Kwan to the US. Last year, the Terra Form founder was arrested in Montenegro after being on the run for months. Both South Korea and the US are seeking Kwon's extradition. In 2022, his company collapsed, wiping out around 40 billion dollars of investors' money. Is China preparing for war? Will it invade Taiwan and take over the island by force? We've asked this question many times on the show, but today Beijing has given its clearest signal. it is spoiling for a fight today china declared that it wants to it wants rather reunification with taiwan and it wants to quote and quote be firm in doing so now this is a major shift because in the past china has phrased this differently it used to say it wants a peaceful reunification with taiwan the word peaceful has now been replaced with firm by this man li chiang he's china's premier less than a year into office he delivered an address to china's rubber stamp parliament today presented his annual report and peppered it with some tough talk on taiwan listen to this we must persist in implementing the party's overall strategy for resolving the taiwan issue in the new era adhere to the one china principle and the 1992 consensus resolutely oppose taiwan separatism and foreign interference 
This is not just a hollow threat. It comes with a bigger military budget. This year, Beijing will boost its defense spending. By how much? A little over 7%. So what is the budget for 2024? $231 billion. The budget for the PLA, the People's Liberation Army this year, $231 billion. It is the biggest increase in five years. And these are the numbers which China chooses to reveal. Ask any expert and they'll tell you that the actual figure is higher. China often ends up overspending on its military. There are parts of the military budget which are kept secret. Like the spending on research and development, they do not declare it to the world. Last week, the US flagged concerns. It's been worried about China's growing military capabilities. America believes the threat from China is growing. It is entering new battlegrounds, including space. Japan, too, is concerned. China continues to increase its defense spending at a high level and is rapidly expanding its military capabilities across a wide range of areas without sufficient transparency. So the PLA gets more money this year. More money means more weapons, more gear. A bigger PLA also means more expansionism. And that's the goal of Xi Jinping. He keeps asking his troops to prepare for war and now he wants to arm them for that war. Taipei is watching this with concern and stepping up its defenses. Today, their defense minister spoke about this. He said Taiwan would have more missile drills this year. And they're not the only ones bracing for Chinese misadventures. The Philippines, too, is on guard. And at the receiving end of China's bullying, there was another incident today. Chinese and Philippine coast guards clashed. Chinese ships engaged in dangerous maneuvers. They bumped into ships from Manila. There were two collisions in all. Both sides deployed water cannons. There were injuries on the Philippine side. So China seems to be, in, seems to be intent on keeping its many territorial disputes alive. Which brings us back to the Premier's speech. It's an annual event. Usually the world tunes into it for insights into the Chinese economy and their plans for the years ahead. And this time, the economy is a sore point for them. Here's what Lee said about it. The main expected development goals for this year are a GDP growth of around 5%, more than 12 million new urban jobs, a registered urban unemployment rate of around 5.5%, a rise of around 3% in consumer price index, synchronous growth of household income and economic growth, and basic balance of international payments. Now, those are some ambitious targets. Beijing is promising growth. The Premier says he wants to boost the economy, but he doesn't say how. How will he do it? China's economy faces a host of problems. Growth has tanked. There is rampant unemployment. Among the youth, it's so bad that China has stopped publishing unemployment data. There is a crisis in the property sector. Since 2021, 40% of home sellers in China have defaulted. 4-0, 40%. Chinese stock markets are in a state of decline. In the last 12 months, they've fallen by 20%. The Indian stock market has surpassed Hong Kong. All these ailing sectors need bailouts. But China won't rescue them. It is more focused on building the PLA, on preparing for war, even if Xi Jinping to sub manages to subdue a small neighbor to boost his ego, it will be a Pyrrhic victory. It's not all coercion though, some countries are willfully falling into China's trap, like the Maldives. Yesterday we told you about President Mohammad Muizu's choice. Does he repair ties with India or does he ally with China? Well, we spoke too soon because Muizu has made his choice. He has signed a defense agreement with China. A defense deal with China. What does it say? In typical Chinese style, it's all secret. We know just two things about this deal. One, it allows China to provide military assistance to the Maldives. And two, it's free of cost. Now, assistance is a broad term. Does it mean giving weapons or military aid? Does it mean sending surveillance technology? Does it mean deploying Chinese officials or does it mean all of the above? Unless you specify, people will assume the worst. But then again, maybe that's Moizu's plan. Look at the chronology of events. First, he asked Indian sailors to leave the Maldives. Then he hosted a Chinese spy vessel. Then he sent civilians to replace... India, rather, sent civilians to replace its soldiers. And now, a defense deal with China. 
So the message is quite clear. Muizu sees his future in the Chinese camp. He wants to keep pulling away from India. And his latest statement confirms that. Listen to this. There will be no Indian troops in the country come May 10th, not in uniform and not in civilian clothing. The Indian military will not be residing in this country in any form of clothing. New Delhi has already agreed to that. The soldiers are on their way out. But Muizu wants to make a spectacle out of it. The question is, how will this affect India's security? And how can New Delhi respond? Some basics first. China has been eyeing the Indian Ocean for a long time, through investments, through debt traps, and through alliances. They've been at it. It's been a multi-decade project. And I'll show you the result on this map. These are all the Chinese bases or ports in the Indian Ocean. First is Djibouti in the Horn of Africa. It has a PLA military base. Then you have Gwadar in Pakistan, built and operated by China. Down south, you have Hambantota in Sri Lanka. China has a 99-year lease on it. Finally, we come to Myanmar. China is building a port in the city of Kyayukpyu. Now, these are the major projects. If you add investments and financing, it's a lot more. Some 21 Chinese ports in the Indian Ocean. Experts call this China string of pearls. Now the question is, will the Maldives become the latest pearl? Will it host a Chinese port or base? Honestly, we can't rule it out, which is why India is making its own moves. We told you about one such move last week. India and Mauritius inaugurated an airstrip and jetty on Agalega. It's a northern island of Mauritius. India invested some $192 million there. Now don't confuse it for a military base, because India is not China. But it does give New Delhi some strategic advantage like information exchange, or surveillance missions, or joint patrols. And India isn't done yet. On Wednesday, the Indian Navy is commissioning a new base. It's called the INS Jatayu. It's located on Lakshadweep's Minikoi Islands. Another project is on Androt. It's an eastern island of Lakshadweep. The plan is to build a new jetty there, one that can host bigger ships. So what's the end game here? What is India trying to do with these bases and airstrips? Listen to what the Navy is saying. With the commissioning of the INS Jatayu, the Indian Navy will strengthen its foothold in the Lakshadweep Islands and extend operational surveillance, reach and sustenance. Let me underline two words here, surveillance and reach. That's what Lakshadweep can offer India. It is located around 400 kilometers from the mainland, sort of like a, a permanent aircraft carrier, a launch pad to track and deter enemies. It will be crucial in the coming years and decades. China is building a massive fleet of warships. It also has a willing partner in President Muizu. If you combine the two, it means trouble for India. We may be looking at the Indian Ocean status, a new status quo in the Indian Ocean. One where India and the Maldives are in opposing camps. And speaking of foreign bases, reports say Iran wanted one in the Sudan. Just one problem though, the Sudanese government has said no. Which also raises some questions like, do Iran and the Sudan get along? Why did Iran want a base in that country and why did the Sudan say no? First, some geography. The Sudan is located in northeastern Africa, just south of Egypt. It has a pretty long coastline along the Red Sea, some 750 kilometers of it, and that's what Iran reportedly wanted. A naval base on the Red Sea. That's what Iran wanted. Two reasons why. Number one, Iran's rivals already have access to the Red Sea, like Saudi Arabia, Israel, Egypt. All of them can access the Red Sea, but Iran cannot. It is located on the other side of the Persian Gulf. So it wants this access. Reason number two, to weaponize maritime trade. You see, Yemen's Houthis are already doing it. They've been attacking commercial ships in the Red Sea. And who supports the Houthis? The Iranian regime. So Tehran knows how important this route, it, route is, how it can scare world powers. Maybe that's why Tehran wants a base there, to keep tabs on rivals, to coordinate with the Houthis, and to check Western powers. But why did the Sudan turn them down? They said no to Iran. Reports say Iran offered them a sweet deal, a helicopter carrier in exchange for a naval base. 
But the Sudan feared a Western backlash. Let me explain this. Until 2019, the Sudan was ruled by an Islamist dictator. His name was Omar al-Bashir. He was quite close to Iran. But that year, 2019, a military coup toppled him. Sudan's generals captured power and they kept Iran at a distance. They wanted to repair relations with the West. Just consider the Abraham Accords. In 2021, the Sudan decided to recognize Israel. In return, they got relief from the United States. The Sudan was removed from the terror watch list. It was also given $1.2 billion in loans, so the generals played along. If they side with the West, they get more benefits. If they side with Iran, they do not. So it's a simple strategic call. Of course, that may change in the future because the Sudan's regime is in trouble. They're fighting a civil war, the army versus the rapid support forces, RSF. It's the country's main paramilitary group. Now, the generals need weapons to fight these rebels. If not, they could lose. And guess who is ready to offer that support? Iran. They've already sold some weapons to the Sudan. So my point is quite simple. The current Red Sea equation is not permanent. The generals can still change sides, meaning Iran can still get a port in the Red Sea. And what would that mean? Possibly more chaos. The Houthis alone have been a handful. Last week, they sunk a British commercial ship. It was hit by two Houthi missiles in February. The damages eventually sank the ship. Then yesterday, three undersea fiber optic cables were damaged. And this is serious. Undersea cables are the lifeline of the internet. All of us use it. Assume that you're browsing an American web page. Chances are it's hosted on a US server. So how are you browsing it in India or Africa or wherever you are? Because your internet provider is using these cables. They transmit data across countries and continents. If you cut these undersea cables, you can disrupt the internet. And that's what has happened now. 25% internet traffic between Asia and Europe has been impacted. Companies are racing to find solutions. So I guess the question is, who cut these cables? The Houthis have not claimed responsibility yet, but clearly they are the prime suspects. Because on Monday they attacked another ship, the MSC Sky. Triumphing over the oppressed Palestinian people and in retaliation for the American-British aggression against our country. The naval forces of the Yemeni armed forces carried out a targeting operation against an Israeli ship MSC Sky in the Arabian Sea with several suitable naval missiles and the hit was accurate and direct. Guess who helped out the ship? The Indian Navy. The INS Kolkata arrived at the attack site late on Monday. Then this morning, firefighting began. Twelve Indian personnel were involved in the mission. Take a look. <laughs> So is this the new normal? I ask because the Houthis seem to like it. They now want ships to obtain permits to take their permission, maybe pay them some money, and then sail through the Red Sea. It's a very dangerous trend. At first, the Houthis said their goal was to deter Israel, to stop the war in Gaza. That's what they wanted, they said. Once the war stopped, so would the attacks. But what if the Houthis changed their plans? After all, this tactic is giving them a lot of attention and money. So what if the Houthis stick to it? That's the new headache for world powers. Back to India now, and there's a showdown in the world of technology. Google versus Indian app developers. It all started last Friday. Around 200 Indian apps were removed from Google's Play Store. You may know some of them, like Naukari, 99 Acres, Shiksha, Shadi.com, Cuckoo FM. The reason was Google's new payments policy. Now, I'm guessing all of you know what in-app payments are, in-app payments. Sometimes apps have premium features or extra services. And to access them, you need to make payments inside that app, hence the name in-app payments. 
Now, Google wanted to charge for these transactions, for these payments. How much? Between 11 and 26 percent. Google wanted that cut, 11 to 26 percent. But the app developers opposed it. They pointed to other payment gateways in India like Razorpay or Cash Free. Guess how much they charge? Between 0 and 4 percent. Google wanted up to 26 percent. So app developers questioned Google's policy. And they refused to comply. Soon the government got involved, the government of India. The IT minister held talks with the developers and Google. And he agreed to find a solution. These developers also approached India's antitrust watchdog. It's called the CCI, the Competition Commission of India. And what was their complaint? They said Google was exploiting its dominant position, that it was causing irreparable harm to the market. And looks like the pressure worked. Because Google is now making a U-turn, it has relisted all the Indian apps. It says it will wait for the Supreme Court of India to settle the matter. So time out for now. But this controversy does raise a few questions. One, does Google have a case here? And two, why are we so dependent on them? Google's Play Store is basically a market, a place where you can buy and get apps. It's also a monopoly. Technically, you can get apps from other markets, like the Galaxy Store or the Huawei App Gallery or the Vivo App Store, but none of them are popular. If you use Android, you use the Play Store. And that gives Google a lot of power. The question is, are they exploiting that powerful position? Here's what the company says. More than 200,000 Indian developers, 2 lakh Indian developers have already agreed to the new billing system. Only 10 holdouts remained. Those companies and their apps got removed, those 10. Google also says the fee is negligible. Only 3% Indian developers use in-app payments. Most of them are charged under 15%. Only 60 developers, 60, pay more than that, more than 15%. Now, I know these numbers seem quite small, certainly not enough to get the government of India involved. But this is not about numbers. This is about principle. Should a company be allowed to exploit its dominant position? In an ideal world, no. But we need to ask ourselves an important question. How did we get here? Why are we so dependent on Google? That is the root of the problem. Almost 95% smartphones in India run on Google's operating system what we call Android, 95% phones in India, chances are all of them use the Play Store. So if you make an app in India, you are at the mercy of Google. You can complain on social media, you can reach out to ministers, but at the end of the day, Google holds all the cards. In fact, they kicked off this race. Google launched the Play Store way back in 2012. It has a 12-year head start. Logic says it's impossible to bridge that gap. But some companies are trying, like PhonePay. PhonePay has launched its own app store. It's called the Indus App Store. And its biggest feature, no fees for in-app payments. I know it sounds great on paper. But the challenge ahead is huge. All Android phones come preloaded with Play Store. Users are hardwired to search for it. So we're talking about a massive behavioral change here, one that could take lots of time and money, which is why companies are wary of this market. You could call it a digital mission impossible. It doesn't mean we can't learn lessons from it. These controversies show why homegrown platforms are so important. You can hold them accountable. You can enforce your laws. Just look at the same Google in the US. Their CEO is one of the biggest names in tech, but in the US Senate, He's grilled like a teenager. He sits patiently, patiently and he takes questions. Why? Because Google is based in the US. It's an American company. India needs to start thinking like that. Maybe it's too late for social media or search engines, but not for new technologies like artificial intelligence. You need to identify and promote such new industries. If not, you will fall behind again. Now, let me ask you what may sound like a strange question. Have you ever wondered what happens to your hair after a haircut? The strands that have been cut, what happens to them? They're trash for you. But for hair traders, it's gold, especially in India. 
because there's massive dema demand overseas for Indian human hair. And guess who is among the biggest buyers? China. In fact, they're so keen on this supply that they have started or resorted to smuggling. Human hair from India, that's what they're smuggling. This week, Indian officials cracked a big case. They found hair worth over a billion dollars being smuggled, mostly to China. India's border forces have been seizing a lot of these shipments lately. Our next report tells you why this has become a hair-raising issue. On the face of it, it may sound amusing, but India's border forces are confronting a hairy situation. This isn't mere wordplay, it's the reality. There's widespread smuggling of human hair out of India. India's Enforcement Directorate has been probing a new case. This is the agency tasked with investigating money laundering cases. They've exposed a smuggling operation. It involves shipping human hair out of the country illegally. Well, hair may seem like a waste when you go to your barber for a haircut, but overseas, it's worth a lot of money. The operation uncovered by the ED involved smuggling of human hair worth $1 billion. And guess who's the biggest buyer? China, followed by other countries like Bangladesh, Myanmar and Vietnam. The smuggling often happens through land routes running through India's neighbouring countries. Human hair export is a big business. Going by one claim, India accounts for 80% of the world's hair exports. That's a big number, which is also the reason behind the deeper scrutiny. A simple Google search exposes the magnitude of the problem. Most of these stories have one thing in common. The bulk of the demand comes from China. So why do the Chinese want to get their hands on Indian hair? Well, there are a few compelling reasons. There's an epidemic of hair loss in China. There are many Chinese who are losing their hair at a very young age. And it's not just the men. In 2020, over 250 million Chinese were diagnosed with hair loss. And out of this, 88 million were women. This has led to an uptick in the demand for wigs and hair extensions. And manufacturers prefer Indian hair. They describe it as lightweight, lustrous, wavy and bouncy. In fact, India is famous for its supply of Remy hair. That's the type with the cuticles still all in one piece. They are believed to be of the finest quality. Where do they come from? Usually from a single source. Many traders gather these from temples in southern India where women are known to shave their heads for religious reasons. But like in any business, the hair exports too suffer from a demand and supply problem. The supply for human hair is hard to come by. So the Chinese have resorted to smuggling. Last year, it was revealed the Chinese buyers were hiring local agents who bought human hair from Indian suppliers and smuggled them out of the country. India is now cracking down hard on this problem. The illegal supply is also a loss for the exchequer as the smugglers end up avoiding any export tax. The problem is a messy one and it may take a while to untangle. As humans, we are entitled to some basic rights. Right to life, right to education, right to work, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. These are some of our basic rights. But here's the contentious one. The right to abortion. It should be a basic right, one that all women should have. But more often than not, it's a flashpoint. France decided to change that. It has made abortion a constitutional right the first country in the world to do so. 902 French lawmakers voted on the bill, 780 voted in favour of it, 72 voted against it and 50 abstained, so it was passed with an overwhelming majority. Supporters cheered on the streets. President Macron called it French pride. The Eiffel Tower lit up in celebration. It sparkled with the message, my body, my choice. It's a proud moment for France. And why wouldn't it be? Worldwide, abortion rights are under attack. 
In 24 countries, it's illegal for women to get an abortion. In 37 countries, it's heavily restricted. The U.S. overturned the right to abortion in 2022. Since then, several states have banned it. You must cross state borders to get an abortion in America. In Europe, Poland cracked down on abortion rights. It outlawed it in many cases. Hungary has tightened abortion laws. Latin America has regressive anti-abortion laws. Africa has the highest death rate when it comes to unsafe abortions. It's illegal in Laos and the Philippines. And in the midst of all of this, France is like a shining beacon. But did Paris do this to protect women's rights? Or was it purely political? Let's look at the facts. France legalized abortion in 1975. It was allowed until 10 weeks of pregnancy. In 2001, it was extended to 12 weeks. In 2022, extended to 14 weeks. You could get an abortion up to 14 weeks into your pregnancy. The procedure was covered by the country's health system. And it's been like that since the 1980s. Plus, there's strong support for it. 86% French citizens favor abortion rights. Even among the right wing, it's quite popular. Before the vote, the French Prime Minister said the right to abortion was in danger. But data shows that was not the case. Since 1975, France's abortion law has been updated nine times and every time access has only been expanded. The people support it, the lawmakers support it. Across the political spectrum, they all want abortion to be legal in France. Of course, enshrining it in the constitution is a great move. But why now? Why did they do it now? Among other things, it makes political sense. President Macron lacks majority in the National Assembly. He passed laws on immigration, on pension reforms, they were vastly unpopular. The left panned him. The right said it wasn't enough. But abortion rights, well, they are like the great unifier. Most lawmakers support the law. It boosts popularity and technically it doesn't change very much on the ground. In France, the right to abortion was already enshrined in the law. It was already a right. So on the ground, nothing changes except for Macron. This move boosts his credentials. He's now the French president who protected abortion rights, which brings us to the politics of abortion. The world over, it is a political tool. In the US, Republican states banned abortion because it suited their voter base. Joe Biden is defending it because it's important for his voters, the Democrats. Poland outlawed it when the right wing was in power. Now the new prime minister wants to overturn it because that's what suits him. So across the world, women's bodies are a political battleground. Lawmakers don't see it as a choice or a right. So women can't make decisions on their reproductive health themselves. More than 40% women in the world can't take those decisions. More than 200 million have no access to contraception and more than a million are denied abortion. When you see France's move against this backdrop, you know that it's just symbolic. Yes, it is important. It's personal for many women, but the fact is it's also political, like any other abortion verdict in the world. Our next story is from Cuba. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you say Cuba? Cigars? Fidel Castro, perhaps? Those are the popular guesses. But have you heard about the Cuban economy? It's been in the headline for some time now. Cuba has raised its fuel prices by 500%. It cancelled its annual May Day parade because of shortage of fuel. It is asking the World Food Programme for powdered milk. There's a shortage of food, there's a shortage of medicines, and this isn't a new crisis. It's been, it's been going on for decades now. Our next report tells you how Cuba went from being the shining beacon in Latin America to a struggling economy. It was the early 1960s. The CIA was busy with Operation Mongoose. America wanted to kill Fidel Castro. They hatched different plans, 33 of them. Some included the usual, like poisoning, hiring hitmen. But some of those plans were downright bizarre, like using a nuclear-tipped cigar. Sounds like the CIA drew inspiration from cartoons. Obviously, the plans did not work. The CIA tried and tried, but Castro had more lives than a cat. So his cigars stayed, as did his revolutionary speeches. 
If you ask anyone, Fidel Castro is synonymous with Cuba. The world knows him as Castro, but for Cubans, he was just Fidel. He was loved by some, hated by many, but no one could ignore him. His beard was recognizable anywhere, so much so that a CIA plan was to make his beard fall out. America believed it would make people lose respect for him and lead to his ouster. That did not happen. Castro was the longest serving non-royal leader of the 20th century. His rule spanned that of 10 US presidents. Castro believed Cuba's problems were because of capitalism. He wanted a people's revolution. So, in 1953, he planned an armed uprising. It was against Fulgencio Batista. He was arrested, he left Cuba, but returned to lead a guerrilla campaign. And in 1959, Castro finally got what he wanted, to rule over Cuba. It was a contentious rule. He was close to the Soviet Union, thus enemy number one for the US. The country hosted Soviet missiles. In 1962, the world was on the brink of an all-out nuclear war, with a small island at the center of it. There were also some remarkable achievements, especially in the domestic sphere. Medical care was free for all. Infant mortality rates were at par with developed nations. Cuba even sent doctors and nurses abroad. Cuban doctors conducted over 2 million cataract operations worldwide. They were all paid by the government in Havana. The country also had an advanced biotech industry. Food rationing was introduced in the 1960s. Basic food necessities like rice, oil and beans are available to all. That too at heavily subsidized prices. It was a policy lauded by many. But with the US embargo and no Soviet lifeline in the 80s, it just wasn't sustainable. There was chronic shortage. Department stores had empty shelves. Food queues grew. People wanted to leave the country. It continued until the early 2000s. That's when Fidel Castro relented. He introduced some free market reforms, but it didn't change much on the ground. Then came his brother, Raul Castro. Raul preferred the free market more. In 2008, personal computers were sold to the general public for the first time ever in the country. But the reforms came too little too late. In the 2010s, the economy was still struggling. Then came the pandemic. And since then, the nation of 11 million has barely recovered. Inflation is at 30%. Last year, the economy shrank by 2%. And this year looks no better. Cuba has hiked fuel prices by 500%. There's a shortage of milk, medicines, and other food items. Which is why Cuba is now asking the World Food Programme for powdered milk. Cuba blames the US sanctions for the crisis. But government mismanagement over many decades is equally to be blamed. Fidel Castro may be long gone, but his policies continue to loom over the island. Cuba was once a crowning jewel in Latin America, but it lost its sheen long ago and is struggling to find a way back. Now let's look at what the US government is up to. Yesterday was fairly standard. New day, new sanctions, normal American Monday blues. Their target was an old favorite, Zimbabwe. It's a country in Southern Africa. It's home to about 17 million people, and they've seen it all. For decades, the country was under the iron fist of Robert Mugabe, a freedom fighter turned dictator. Sadly, a common story. He ruled for 30 years, then planned to hand over power to his wife. But in 2017, he was ousted in a coup. Instead of his wife, his vice president took over, continuing the cycle of single party rule and oppression, just with a different face in charge. As you can tell, the country has been through a lot, including American sanctions. Zimbabwe has been subjected to them for decades now, especially their political class. Washington accuses Zimbabwe's ruling party, the ZANU-PF, of corruption, political repression and other standard autocratic behavior. These sanctions have never had their desired effect. As I said, Zimbabwe continues to be run by the same party, the ZANU-PF. So we keep hearing stories about rigged elections and dead opposition figures. No matter what the US has tried, they remain a constant. This may remind you of the old adage, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. But believe it or not, this time it is different.
the U.S. decided to fine-tune its sanctions. Instead of carpet bombing, they went for a precision strike approach, restricting the sanctions to just the top brass and bringing relief to many unfairly targeted people. The latest sanctions target just 11 individuals and three companies in Zimbabwe. Most of these people were already on the list, like Zimbabwe's president, Emerson Nangagwa, Mugabe's vice president, who is now the man in charge. He is accused of ordering the political repression and of abetting corruption on a grand scale. Look at the U.S. Treasury Department's accusations. They say the president provides protection to gold and diamond smugglers. He is accused of taking bribes to allow them to smuggle precious minerals out of the country and sell them in quote-unquote illicit markets. Zimbabwe's president is also accused of misappropriating state assets and corruption in handing out government contracts. This is why the U.S. has kept him under sanctions. There are also other government officials on the list, like one of the country's vice presidents and the defense minister. They're there for political repression. That's what they're accused of. The new inductees include the first lady of Zimbabwe, Auxilia Nangagwa. She's accused of facilitating her husband's corruption. Then there are some shady businessmen and their companies and some police officials, so standard stuff there. But again, this list is very precise. Like I said, just 11 people and three firms, the U.S. has actually removed more sanctions than it has imposed. Removed them from dozens of companies and individuals in Zimbabwe, bringing relief to hundreds of people in the country. The Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Treasury, Wally Adiyamo, has said this, and I'm quoting, the changes we are making today are intended to make clear what has always been true. Our sanctions are not intended to target the people of Zimbabwe. That is why this no longer seems like insanity. The approach, like we said, has changed. American sanctions no longer threaten ordinary people and Zimbabwe's government is calling this a victory. Even though their president is under sanctions, they say this is a vindication of his foreign policy. Talk about turning a defeat into a celebration, though they're still upset. One government spokesperson said this, that as long as the first family is under sanctions, all of Zimbabwe remains under sanctions, which is not true, though. The president and his wife will still feel the pinch, but many ordinary citizens will get relief. They no longer have to pay for the crimes of their political overlords. They never should have had to. It was always a mistake, but at least... That has been rectified now, so hopefully America will stick by this new, less insane approach. When you hear the word scam, what do you think of? These days, cryptocurrency perhaps, the fall of FTX and Sam Bankman Fried, or maybe Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes. Our more seasoned viewers may remember Bernie Madoff, Worldcom, or the biggest scandal of all, Enron. But massive scams are not exclusive to the US. As in all other spheres, Asia is catching up. Today, a trial began in Vietnam in a $12.5 billion scam, a real estate scam involving a woman called Truong Mai Lan. She's a 67-year-old real estate tycoon who began selling cosmetics at the age of 16 and went on to control 90% of a bank. A bank? and a real estate empire. Today, she was brought before a court in Vietnam in what's being called their trial of the century. Here's our report. Chức vụ gì trong ngân hàng thương mại cổ phần Sài Gòn, SCB? Thế nhưng với việc nắm giữ... Vietnamese state-run television is being kind. They've decided to blur the face of Thuong Mai Lan, even though she's quite famous in the country. After all, she's one of the richest people there. She made her fortune in the world of real estate. And now she's on trial. Why? Because her fortune was apparently built on a million lies. Throng Mai Lan stands accused of orchestrating one of, if not the biggest scam in Vietnam's history. The scam amounts to almost $12.5 billion, more than FTX and Sam Bankman Freed, more than double Malaysia's 1MDB scam. The scandal is one of the biggest in all of Asia. And if proven guilty, the tycoon risks getting the death penalty. So let's look at how this happened. Lan founded the VTP Group real estate company in 1991. She was among a host of developers building high-end commercial and residential properties in Vietnam. 
As her company kept growing, she needed more money to fund new projects. She often got this in the form of loans from banks. One bank in particular stands out, the Saigon Joint Stock Commercial Bank. SCB, as it's known, dispersed loans worth $43 billion to Lan and her associates. This was between 2012 and 2022. 2012 was the year the bank was formed. The same year, Lan became a shareholder there. Now, you may wonder, how can a bank give that much money to one party, even if they're a shareholder? After all, the bank gives loans using customer deposits, so there must have been some checks and balances, right? Well, they usually are, but not when one party owns 90% of the bank. It turns out Lan had a network of 27 individuals who owned shares in the bank on her behalf. It allowed her to control the bank and control how it spent its money. A lot of it went into buying bonds from Lan's company, after which it was embezzled. To keep all this under wraps, Lan allegedly paid the people who were supposed to keep watch. Standing trial with her today are 15 State Bank of Vietnam officials, three government inspectors and a former official at the State Audit Office. Together, they had managed to keep Vietnam's government in the dark for almost 10 years, until 2022. That was when Lan was finally arrested. But even then, Vietnamese authorities apparently didn't know about the scale of the scam. They arrested her for some thousands of dollars worth of embezzlement. But that changed when they found a diary belonging to Lan's personal driver. It reportedly contained meticulous notes about the cash he had ferried, amounting to $4.4 billion. Just think about that. There was a man who had spent years driving billions of dollars in cash around the streets of Ho Chi Minh City. The Vietnamese investigators were shocked, and that's when they widened their probe, bringing us to where we are today. The trial is underway. It's expected to last till April. Almost 90% of the people who are involved have been charged in the scam, and some may get the death penalty. Vietnam will hope this trial sends a message. The country has been struggling with corruption for years now, so a harsh sentence in a high-profile case like this may have a ripple effect. But for now, this scam is a stain on Vietnam's reputation, and Hanoi will need to do a lot to restore confidence in the country. Do you remember what happened in 2008? The world witnessed a global economic crisis. Banking collapsed. Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. Merrill Lynch, AIG, Royal Bank of Scotland, they were about to meet the same fate, but the crisis did not just affect banks. The ramifications were felt across industries, including fashion. Legacy companies filed for bankruptcy. Big brands saw drops in revenue. But do you know who managed to thrive? A new cohort of fashion companies, fast fashion brands. You see, in times of crisis, people do not stop shopping. They just buy more affordable items, like cheap, poorly made clothes. Mass produced at breakneck speed. So fast fashion made the cut. In 2008, its market share expanded. Companies like Boohoo and Azos were rolling in profits. We saw this during another crisis as well, the pandemic. When fast fashion mogul Sheen made a huge leap, it made $2.5 billion from online sales in 2019, just before the pandemic. By 2020, the number had jumped to $8.4 billion, which is a 236% increase. And fast fashion is still soaring. With cost of living crises and growing unemployment, people are lapping up affordable clothes. The global market for fast fashion is worth $106 billion. $106 billion. By 2027, it is expected to reach $185 billion. But France wants to slow down fast fashion. It has proposed a new bill. Their fast fashion brands will be subject to penalties up to 50% of a garment selling price. Why? Because France claims that an average brand renews its collection four times a year, but fast fashion brands offer thousands of products every day. Sheen, for example, offers more than 7,000 new garment models a day. France says this incites excessive spending and creates unnecessary pollution. So it wants to penalize the brands to offset their environmental impact. 
And France is not wrong. Textile production generates 10% of global carbon emissions, yet 80 billion pieces of new clothing are purchased every year the world over. And what happens to so many clothes? Every three in five of these items end up in landfills. So why don't consumers reduce the burden? A, because buyers alone cannot change an entire industry, and B, they can't give up on easy, fast, cheap clothes, it seems. So why don't companies change their ways? Because fashion is full of hollow claims about using recycled material or paying fair wages to workers. Most of these promises are made by, by brands themselves. So their progress is self-reported. And brands go largely unchecked. If they don't meet targets, they don't face punishment. And they do not reform themselves. But change seems to be in the air, and France is not alone here. Over the past few years, governments seem to be waking up to this. A raft of new regulatory proposals and laws have emerged. Last year, the EU banned destruction of unsold clothing, the European Union. The year before, it demanded that companies make long-lasting clothes. And if caught misleading consumers about greenwashing, they would face penalties. Meanwhile, Norway and Germany have due diligence acts. They demand that companies address negative impact on the planet or face hefty fines and operational bans. Britain and the Netherlands do not have such laws, but they're frequently cracking down on greenwashing claims by fast fashion brands. Meanwhile, in the US, New York has proposed the Fashion Act. If passed, it will demand that big clothing companies disclose their supply chains. So labor abuses, greenhouse gases and chemical use won't remain hidden. So far, the West seems to be leading the charge. Yes, the regulatory changes will be felt across the world, like improved labor conditions and lower pollution levels, but other key players cannot be missing in action, like the global powerhouse of fashion production, which is Asia. Because if not curtailed, fast fashion will only get faster and destroy our world at greater speed. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story in Finland. A massive NATO exercise brings together Swedish and Finnish soldiers, both new members of this alliance. In Tokyo, robots deliver food in parts of the city. And Paris unveils official posters for the 2024 Olympic Games with a nod to surrealism. Finally, we are also taking you back in history. On this day in 1946, Winston Churchill fired the opening shot of the Cold War at a college in Missouri. He declared that an iron curtain had descended over Europe. In the years that followed, the iron curtain symbolized the division between the Western Bloc and the Soviet Bloc. We are leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We will see you tomorrow.
From impeachments to inaugurations, if it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up. We're beating Biden. How dare he say that? If it's breaking news, we're live with the latest coverage. From the White House, the State Department, and Capitol Hill, we know the issues, but above all, we know the players to bring you the latest in-depth analysis on all the key stories that we're covering. I'm Eric Ham. Join me from Washington here on First Post America. Hello and welcome to First Post America, your global pit stop for the latest news and headlines from the United States and around the world. I'm Eric Ham coming to you live from the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. We'll get you a roundup of the day's top stories, but first, let's take a look at the headlines. No breakthrough yet in ceasefire talks between Hamas and mediators in Cairo. Hamas says the talks will be extended for a day. The aim is to halt fighting in time for the start of Ramadan. Ukraine claims its forces have destroyed a Russian military patrol boat near the Crimean Peninsula adding to the string of attacks on Moscow's Black Sea Fleet. Former President Donald Trump's grip on the Republican nomination for president is all but certain as 16 states and one U.S. territory hold primary votes today on Super Tuesday. North Korea says Seoul and Washington would pay a dear price over large-scale military exercises urging them to cease frantic war drills. And finally, Tesla halts production at its German factory after suspects allegedly set fire to high voltage lines nearby, cutting power to the American car makers only plant in Europe. We begin in the, with the latest from the Middle East, where a United Nations team has found clear and convincing information that hostages held by Hamas in Gaza were sexually abused. A report submitted by United Nations Special Envoy on sexual violence and conflict says that some women and children hostages had been subject to rape and sexualized torture. The report states that the team has reasonable grounds to believe such abuses were in fact taking place. With regard to the hostages taken to Gaza, we found clear and convincing information that sexual violence, including rape, sexualized torture, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment has been committed against captives. And we also have reasonable grounds to believe that such violence may still be ongoing against those still held in captivity. I pause and must add that I am of the strong opinion that this finding does not in any way legitimize further violence, but actually reinforces the need for an urgent ceasefire. Now, UN Special Envoy Pramila Patton also reported that the team had reasonable grounds to believe sexual assaults, including rape and gang rape, took place during the October 7 attacks by Hamas. We also found that there are reasonable grounds to believe that conflict-related sexual violence, including rape and gang rape, occurred during the 7th of October attacks in at least three locations, namely the Nova Music Festival site and its surroundings, Road 232 and Kibbutz Reim. And in most of these incidents, victims were first subjected to rape and then killed. And at least two incidents relate to the rape of women's corpses. The Special Envoy Patton led a nine-member team of experts to Israel and the West Bank last month, but the team cautioned there were limitations on what it could actually achieve. 
Chief among those limitations was a lack of access to survivors of these actual attacks. In fact, Patton said the team did not manage to meet any survivors of sexual violence during the October 7th attacks. However, they were able to talk to multiple witnesses, released hostages, and were able to review video footage and pictures. The report was finalized based on first-hand accounts of released hostages. Now the report emerges amid soaring tensions over the handling of allegations of sexual assault by Hamas. And now Israel has accused the United Nations of taking too long to respond to these claims. And in a further stinging rebuke, Israel has recalled its ambassador from the United Nations. The UN, however, has defended itself against Israel's allegations. This year, the UN and UN women's silence in the face of Hamas sexual violence turned International Women's Day into a sick joke. This is the peak of the UN's hypocrisy. The UN claims to care about women. Yet, as we speak, right now, Israeli women are being raped and abused by Hamas terrorists. Where is the UN's voice? Where is your voice? Colleagues, I call on the Secretary General and the Security Council to convene immediately to finally, finally condemn Hamas's heinous crimes. Hamas must face unrelenting pressure to end their sexual violence and release all of the hostages immediately. Now at the heart of this bitter dispute between Israel and the United Nations is also the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees. Several Western countries, including the United States, have pulled funding to the UNRWA after Israel accused nearly a dozen of its employees of involvement in the October 7 attack. The Israeli Defense Ministry further alleges that the UN aid agency in Gaza employed more than 450 military operatives from Hamas and other armed groups. Over 450 UNRWA employees are military operatives in terror groups in Gaza. Over 450. This is no mere coincidence. This is systematic. There is no claiming we did not know. Hamas exploits humanitarian organizations and uses them to commit crimes against humanity. These terrorists are employed by UNRWA. They receive salaries that are paid for by the international community. Donations that are meant for humanitarian purposes, meant to benefit the people of Gaza, are funding mass murderers and rapists. UNRWA has been proven to be an instrumental part of Hamas's terror machine. Yet rather than take responsibility for the weaponization of this UN agency, senior UN officials have chosen to say that they had no knowledge of Hamas's hold on the agency. Now the head of the UN Palestinian Refugee Agency has warned of a deliberate and concerted campaign aimed at ending its operations in Gaza. The agency head has also called out Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for openly stating that the UNRWA will not be a part of a post-war Gaza. The fate of the agency and the millions of people who depend on it hung in the balance. Excellencies, UNRWA is facing a deliberate and concerted campaign to undermine its operations and ultimately end them. More blatant is the Israeli Prime Minister openly stating that UNRWA will not be part of post-war Gaza. The implementation of this plan is already on the way with the destruction of our infrastructure across Gaza Strip. The assembly cannot look away as Israel continues targeting UNRWA with attacks on its staff and premises, obstruction of its humanitarian aid, attempts to evict it, from occupied East Jerusalem and a defamation campaign that has thrown its financial situation into turmoil after a sudden suspension 
of funding by several major donors. That this is happening in the midst of the ongoing catastrophe in Gaza makes it even more harrowing. Now on Monday, the UN Palestinian Refugee Agency said members of its own staff had been detained, tortured, and sexually abused by Israel. It also claims that some of its staff had been forced to sign confessions related to the October 7th attack. The Israeli military called these claims unsubstantiated. It said that this was a cynical attempt to create false equivalency with the systematic use of rape as a weapon of war by Hamas. The UNRWA employs around 30,000 people in the occupied Palestinian territories, Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria, with about 13,000 staff in the Gaza Strip. It's also been at the center of providing humanitarian relief in Gaza, where aid groups are warning of a looming famine after five months of war. And now from Hamas to the Houthis, as the Iran-backed group escalates attacks in the Red Sea, reports say submarine cables in the region have been severely damaged. According to a Hong Kong telecoms company, cables belonging to four major telecom networks have been cut. Now this has affected at least 25% of telecommunication traffic flowing through the Red Sea. It's also forced providers to reroute traffic between Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. Now, experts say repairs are unlikely to take place for at least another month. These underwater cables are seen as an invisible force driving the internet in the region. In fact, many of them have been funded by tech giants such as Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Meta. Any damage to these networks can cause widespread internet outages as seen following the 2006 Taiwan earthquake. The destruction of underwater cables in the Red Sea comes weeks after Yemen's government warned of the possibility of Houthi rebels targeting these very networks. Now, Israel has blamed the Houthis for damage to the cables. However, the Iran-backed group has denied any and all allegations. The Houthis have instead blamed the United States and the UK militaries operating throughout the region. The Houthis have been relentlessly targeting shipping vessels in the Red Sea the Bab al mandab Strait, and the Gulf of Aden. In the latest, the Iran-backed group claims to have attacked an Israeli ship in the Arabian Sea. Triumphing over the oppressed Palestinian people and in retaliation for the American-British aggression against our country, the naval forces of the Yemeni Armed Forces carried out a targeting operation against an Israeli ship, MSC Sky, in the Arabian Sea with several suitable naval missiles and the hit was accurate and direct. The targeting operation came only hours after carrying out a qualitative operation during which the missile force and the unmanned air force launched several ballistic missiles and drones at many enemy American warships in the Red Sea. Now the Houthis say their attacks are in solidarity with the people of Gaza. In retaliation for these attacks, the United States and the UK have been targeting Houthi infrastructure throughout Yemen. Now, however, despite more than a month and a half of U.S.-led strikes, the Houthis remain undeterred in their ongoing attacks. In fact, the Houthis insist their attacks will continue until Israel stops its combat operations in the Gaza Strip. Russian President Vladimir Putin has found another way to divide Europe, this time using tricks from his spy manual. Moscow has published an audio leak reported to be from a conference call of Germany's high-ranking military officials. The leaked audio is almost 40 minutes long and includes the German Air Force's top brass discussing sending weapons to Ukraine. The military officers are heard discussing the logistics needed for delivering the Taurus cruise missile to Kyiv. The Taurus missile is an air-launched cruise missile which is known for its precision and can hit targets up to 500 kilometers away. Germany's senior Air Force officers discussed how Ukraine could be best use the cruise missile against Russia. Some even suggested using up to 20 Taurus missiles to target the Kerch Bridge which connects the Crimean Peninsula to Russia. The German officers even discussed providing coordinates of Russian infrastructure to Ukraine 
for carrying out these very attacks. However, their preparations have been cut short with the audio, audio leak, which has left German Chancellor Olaf Scholz livid. That's what has been reported there is a very serious matter and therefore this will be investigated very carefully, very intensively and very quickly. That's necessary. Now the audio leak has raised an alarm in Germany and NATO over the failure of European intelligence agencies. Russia has accused Germany of wargaming attacks on behalf of Ukraine in question if Chancellor Schultz is aware that the Air Force was planning such an attack. We have recently witnessed the facts that have been revealed about the confrontation between German Chancellor Scholz and the Bundeswehr, about some cunning plans of the Bundeswehr, which became apparent due to the publication of this audio recording about how they are thoroughly preparing an attack on Crimea Bridge, on other objects including munitions warehouses, and mostly how at the same time they want to necessarily trick everyone so that suspicion falls not on them but on the Americans and the British who are already there. This is a blatant self-exposure. The leaked recording puts a spotlight on growing frustrations in the German military. In fact, just last week, Chancellor Schultz had already refused to send Taurus missiles to Ukraine, citing it could drag them into a direct conflict with Russia. Even the UK, which has intensified its lobbying on the Taurus missile, urging Germany to supply the long-range missiles to Kyiv. The German leader has now authorized a full investigation into the audio leak, calling it an attempt by Putin to, to divide Europe. We are scrutinizing everything now that we have the findings of the German military counterintelligence service. Everything is being scrutinized and checked to see whether the wrong classification has been made here, the wrong platform used, are the guidelines sufficient, the rules we have, or do we need to adapt them? And then we will quickly draw the appropriate conclusions. Meanwhile, opposition leaders in Germany have called for Chancellor Schultz to step down, calling him the weakest link in Europe. In fact, just yesterday, Schultz reaffirmed his stance on not sending Taurus missiles to Ukraine. But it looks like now the cat is, in fact, out of the bag in Germany's military's campaign has been foiled by Russia. For Vladimir Putin, it's mission accomplished. And moving from espionage concerns in Germany to legal intrigue in Washington, the U.S. Supreme Court has handed Donald Trump a major victory, overturning a Colorado court ruling that barred him from the state's primary ballot. The Supreme Court has said states cannot bar the former president from contesting in the primaries. Now, what does this mean for Trump and his presidential campaign? Our next report gets you all the details. In a massive victory for Donald Trump amid his compounding legal woes, the U.S. Supreme Court has removed a potential hurdle from his presidential campaign as the former president eyes another run to the White House. The U.S. top court has slammed the door on Colorado's effort to remove Trump from its primary presidential ballot. Citing the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, the court ruled that only the Congress has the power to strike the former president from ballot. The court didn't opine on whether Trump engaged in insurrection on January 6, 2021. It didn't even discuss whether the attack on the U.S. Capitol by Trump supporters constituted an insurrection or not. And neither did it delve into whether presidents are specifically exempt from the 14th Amendment's insurrection language. The 14th Amendment bars office holders engaging in insurrection from holding the office. All that the court focused on was which authorities have the power to enforce the insurrection provision, which in this case, the court said was the Congress. So, with a closely divided Senate and a Republican-controlled House, the chances of Trump being ruled ineligible under the 14th Amendment are essentially nil. Thank you very much. I want to start by thanking the Supreme Court for its unanimous decision today. It was a very important decision. We're very well crafted. And I think it will go a long way toward bringing our country together, which our country needs. And uh, they worked long, they worked hard, and frankly, they worked very quickly on something that will 
be spoken about 100 years from now and 200 years from now, extremely important. Essentially, you cannot take somebody out of a race because an opponent would like to have it that way. And it has nothing to do with the fact that it's the leading candidate, whether it was the leading candidate or a candidate that was well down on the totem pole, you cannot take somebody out of a race. The voters can take the person out of the race very quickly, but a court shouldn't be doing that, and the Supreme Court saw that very well. Last year, the Colorado top court found Trump engaged in an insurrection and ruled that he was ineligible to appear on the state's ballot. Now, the Supreme Court ruling sidesteps some of the biggest political landmines in the case. It also dismisses challenges for Trump in other states. Both Maine and Illinois also moved to take Trump off the ballot. After the ruling, Trump accused Biden of weaponizing and using prosecutors and judges against him. I will say that President Biden, number one, stop weaponization. Fight your fight yourself. Don't use prosecutors and judges to go after your opponent, to try and damage your opponent so you can win an election. Our country is much bigger than that. The other thing I say to President Biden, close the borders now. This is not sustainable for our country. It's not sustainable for our cities. Our country is under siege. Both Maine and Colorado, along with 14 other states, are voting in primaries in a marathon contest. And Trump's legal victory came just ahead of Super Tuesday, where the former president is expected to sweep and defeat his sole remaining but distant opponent, Nikki Haley, in every battleground. And finally, the West African nation of Nigeria is on the brink of an economic meltdown. Rising inflation rates and skyrocketing prices of food have exacerbated the crisis. Basic necessities have become luxuries for people in Nigeria. Desperate to get food, residents in Nigeria's capital city of Abuja are breaking into government warehouses to steal food and grains. To contain the crisis, the Nigerian government has now beefed up security at its food warehouses. Here's our report. Africa's largest economy is battling its worst ever crisis. With soaring inflation and skyrocketing food costs, Nigeria is on the brink of a meltdown. And the turmoil has been the most punishing for its people. There have been angry protests and nationwide strikes. But the plight of Nigeria's citizens is only deteriorating. A litre of petrol costs more than three times what it did just months ago. Wages have not been keeping up with the mounting cost of living. What's worse is that prices of food staples have more than doubled in the past year. I cannot afford to buy petrol to power my generator to water the farm because of the high cost of petrol. Things are difficult in the country. Food is expensive as well as several other items. The price of gari and rice are high. With these high costs of goods, we cannot train our children in school or manage to buy any food. Now desperate to fight starvation, many are turning to theft and looting. In Nigeria's capital city of Abuja, hundreds are forcing their way into warehouses and stealing food. Incidents of food theft and looting of warehouses are becoming a common sight in Nigeria. The authorities, overwhelmed by the scale of the crisis, are scrambling to maintain order. They're calling it a crime beyond hunger. The National Emergency Management Agency has vowed to fortify its facilities. The security measures around these food facilities have now been tightened. The government says it's determined to prevent further breaches of law and order. Experts believe the current situation is so dire that it might leave the future generations struggling to get food. We are suffering, we are suffering in Nigeria. Are suffering. It was not like this before and it's we want like a change before. for good. But there is real hunger in Nigeria. Children are hungry, adults Long are hungry day. and there's just too much suffering. 
Thousands are devoid of basic food products like meat, eggs and milk. In the northern regions, desperation is reaching new heights every day, as people resort to consuming low-grade rice that's fit only for fish. Ant hills are becoming treasure troves as people scavenge for stored grains. A testament to the dire circumstances gripping the nation. The origins of Nigeria's woes can be traced back to the policies enacted by its president, Bola Ahmad Tinubu. Since assuming office in May last year, his decisions have only exacerbated the nation's plight. He scrapped fuel subsidies, brought in currency controls, and this shot up petrol prices and plummeted Nigeria's currency Naira against the US dollar. Inflation rates have been on a relentless climb in Nigeria. In December, it rose above 30%, the highest in 27 years. To be precise, Tinubu's policy changes unleashed a tidal wave of economic turmoil. However, the Nigerian president touts these measures as bold reforms aimed at reviving the economy. He says that by doing this, Nigeria has saved over 1 trillion naira, which is equivalent to over 1 billion US dollars. He also asked citizens to be patient as he says the reforms will take some time to take effect. Tinubu believes his policies will attract foreign investment, which will turn Nigeria's fate. But critics argue that the policy changes have only served to widen the gap between the haves and the have-nots. The situation has only pushed the most vulnerable members of society into further despair. That's our show for today. We thank you so much for tuning in once again. We look forward to seeing you right back here tomorrow at the exact same time. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great day. From impeachments to inaugurations, if it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up. We're beating Biden. How dare he say that? If it's breaking news, we're live with the latest coverage. From the White House, the State Department, and Capitol Hill, we know the issues, but above all, we know the players to bring you the latest in-depth analysis on all the key stories that we're covering. I'm Eric Ham. Join me from Washington here on First Post America.